All right, I'm going to talk uh, this morning about the importance of eschatology. And here's the point. You know, they, they say, tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Um, eschatology is not advanced studies. This was basic Christianity 101 in the first century. So I'll explain why as we go through this. But we have this idea that when we talk about end times that it's not important. I, I beg to differ. And we also believe that this is like graduate level training. It really isn't as you'll see uh, today. Uh, let me start the study with this. And I've shared this slide with you maybe six months ago in one presentation that I've done, one Sunday morning message. You take three young men that all surrender to preach. They love the Lord. They are born again, genuinely born again. And they want to go into ministry. They feel called to go into ministry. Yet one goes to a Baptist seminary, one goes to a Presbyterian seminary, one goes to a Church of Christ seminary. After they graduate, the Baptist believes these doctrinal truths. Uh, the Presbyterian graduates and believes these doctrinal truths, substantial ones being the same, salvation by grace through faith, but a difference in baptism and a difference in dispensationalism. And then you've got this other uh, young man that has gone through seminary that has completely different views on both of these, yet all three have mastered the subject. They're all doctors of divinity, all professing to study the same book. How is that humanly possible? Well, folks, it shouldn't be possible. But the difference is exegesis versus eisegesis. That's why you hear me do so much in review. That's why every time I teach, especially something that comes with dispensational truths, we'll go back and may, we may start briefly all the way back in Genesis and work our way quickly through the flood so you can see as God is unveiling His truth. The Bible is a progressive revelation. Let me ask you, what truths did Adam have in Genesis 1? Well, he, only, he walked with God daily. Don't know what all they talked about. Don't know for how long. My suspicion is that it was less than 30 days before they sinned. Why do you say that, Pastor? Well, because Eve hadn't gotten pregnant yet. And sex was something that God gave to Adam and Eve, and they were commanded to fill the earth. I don't think they were there a long time, but they walked together. Adam had one restriction, just one. Son, all of this you're managing. One tree in the middle of the garden, hands off. You know good. But if you disobey me, you'll know evil. You don't want to go there. Not good. Stay away from that tree. That's all he had and failed. So we, by Genesis 3, when Adam and sin, God revealed more. When he gave the first revelation of the Messiah. When he slew the lamb, uh, covered them in skins, blood was shed. They were covered with clothing. Their, their nakedness was covered by God's covering, his atonement, the sacrificial blood of an innocent substitute. And they had tried to cover themselves with their own work, covering with leaves. God said, that's not good enough. He gave them a visual lesson, a PowerPoint, basically. Well, I'd rather use PowerPoint than actually kill a lamb up here. Well, I tell you what, you'd take that truth home with you. I promise you, you wouldn't, that wouldn't be a lesson you soon forgot. And, and they were taught that truth. The promised seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent. So again, truth is progressively revealed throughout the course of Scripture. That's why I love to take everything in context, and that's why we do so much background. Now, recognize that uh, exegesis is when you read the Bible, and the Bible tells you what it says. Eisegesis is when you have a preconceived destination, and then you go through the Bible and look for verses that you can use to prove that you are right. Folks, if you do that, you can prove just about anything. My dad used to say, uh, you know, Judas went and hanged himself. Another passage of Scripture says, go thou and do likewise. Okay? So you cannot cherry pick. You must take it in context, recognize who's writing, who they're writing to, what they're writing about, and remember the Jewish worldview in which the Bible was written. Of course, hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. This is something that's fundamental. Across every dispensation, there are two groups of people, believers and unbelievers. Ultimately, there's going to be one group that's forever with God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and one group that's forever in the lake of fire. Now, Adam was not a part of the ecclesia, but he was a believer. Adam was not a Jew. 
The first Jew wouldn't be around for about another 2,500 years. But Adam was a believer. Seth was a believer. Enoch was a believer. Noah was a believer. They would all be part of the resurrection of life. And then there's the resurrection of the damnation. Doesn't matter which dispensation. And when you hear Dan or I use the word dispensation, here's what it means. There's one God. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, God's management does change over time. Everybody, even dominionists, what a dominionist is, I mean, just brief, we can cover a lot of ground, but dominionists believe that the church is going to get better and better and stronger and stronger until one day the whole world is so holy that Jesus comes back and sets up His kingdom. Now, I don't believe that. I think, you know, Paul says in the last days it's going to be perilous times. I see what the Revelation talks about is that last seven years of great tribulation. I see a movement towards global government, which we're going to talk about in the next session, and ultimately the rise of a super politician who is a pseudo-Christ. We use the word antichrist, really a pseudo-Christ. He's going to present himself as the real deal, only he's not the real deal. Okay? But dispensation means how God administers his government. Let me give you an example. During the dispensation of Joshua and Jacob's childhood, I was their father, but I dispensed uh, punishment with, actually it was, the, what would I call the, the peacemaker. I had a nice belt, leather, about an inch and a half. By the way, it had like a 40-inch waist back then, so it had some power to it, and it was about an inch and a half thick. That was the peacemaker. That's how I administered justice. And they had such commands as, boys, don't cross the street. Okay? Well, now, they, then they got into their 18s and 19s, 20. Well, I'm still the same father, still the same moral code. They're still the same children. However, I didn't tell them they couldn't cross the street. You can cross the street. Be careful when you drive and make sure you get home before your curfew. And by the way, uh, when Jacob is six foot eight, I didn't spank him anymore. I was afraid he was going to take the belt away and spank me. So I disciplined rather than Still the same father, same son, but it was a different dispensation. You see what I'm saying? Okay, same thing is true with us. We have, there's obviously a dispensational change when Adam sinned. Prior to that, Adam and Eve walked around naked. They had one requirement, don't eat of the tree. There obviously was a dispensational change when Jesus bowed his head and dismissed the spirit, the, the, or dismissed his spirit. The scripture says that the veil in the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. That revealed something. No longer did we have an earthly high priest that only went into the Holy of Holies once a year. But now Jesus was our high priest. And we could at any point in time approach the, the throne of God's mercy and grace. So that is dispensation to believers and unbelievers. Okay. Recognize that there are three people groups through which God works. Jews, Gentiles, and the church. Gentiles exclusively from Adam up until the introduction of Abraham. From Abraham through Acts 2. We see God working through the Jews. Then we see the, re the rejection of the Messiah. We see the birth of the church. We see the introduction of the ecclesia that's called out assembly, which was a mystery hidden in the Old Testament that Paul had the privilege of revealing in Ephesians. And then eventually the church goes, to, the bride goes to be with the bridegroom. Jews are again being dealt with specifically during the 70th week of God's judgment upon Israel and uh, Jerusalem. Okay? So this, you've heard me do this outline before. We see everything pointing forward. We see a creation. We see the flood. We see Abraham's call. We see the nation of Israel. We see the 12 sons going into uh, captivity in Egypt. We see the exodus as they come out, a great nation uh, uh, some 400 years later. We see the disobedience. We see the wandering recorded in the book of Numbers. We see the law given in Exodus and Leviticus. We see the law repeated in Deuteronomy just before the Jews cross into the promised land. We see 400 years of living as a Republican government. Then we see disobedience. Every man did what was right in his own eyes and the call for a king. We saw the willful King Saul. Then we saw the man after God's own heart, King David. We saw the descendants of David. We saw apostles. We saw the division of the kingdom after Solomon. We saw God's prophets go and warn them, coming, calling them back. And we see the destruction of the northern kingdom in 722.
1too we see the destruction of the southern kingdom in 606 then we see the return 70 years later in 536 but never fully and we see more prophets pointing to the coming of the Messiah finishing with Malachi which says to be continued with a forerunner named Elijah then we see in the Gospels a forerunner named John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah and we see the four Gospels which are very Jewish giving testimony that Jesus was the promised Messiah he was the king of the Jews he was the suffering servant he was the son of man and he was the son of God then we see the birth of the church in Acts which we'll come back to then we see these letters of instruction folks these letters what we call epistles are written to individuals or to congregations by Paul by James by John by Peter dealing with specific issues and questions Hey, Paul, remember that deal you said about uh, sexual immorality? Now, how was it we were supposed to handle that when somebody is misbehaving? And Paul wrote the letter to the church in Corinth. And then he added some other stuff. Romans was very comprehensive. Paul had never been to Rome before, and he had to cover a lot. Folks, here's something that you're going to learn that virtually nobody else has taught. The background of Romans was anti-Semitism. You'll understand much of what's being dealt with when you understand the situation. Under Emperor Claudius, the Jews had been driven out of Rome. By the way, what were all the churches initially? They were 100% Jewish, were they not? And then they became more Greek as Gentiles became believers. Then, during the reign of Claudius, for 11 years, Jews were forbidden from being in Rome. They were driven out. That's why Achilla and Priscilla met Paul in Corinth, it says in Acts chapter 18. Well, what happened to those congregations? They became very anti-Semitic. When the Jews came back, they weren't being kosher. They weren't sensitive at all about their Jewish brothers in Christ. And Paul was commending them to be mature in their faith even though they perhaps didn't have to, but to love their brothers above themselves. That's what Romans is dealing with. Galatians does just the opposite. In Romans, you have Gentiles that hated Jews. In Galatians, you had Gentiles that wanted to become Jewish. And Paul dealt with that issue. In Ephesians, God, Paul deals with the subject of the church, and so on and so forth. So these epistles are all specific uh, in, in areas of instruction. By the way, all of them cover a little bit of doctrine, and then a whole lot of behavior. You know what the main emphasis of behavior is? Loving your brothers. Make sure you don't gossip. Make sure you're there for and encourage them. Think of them first. By the way, rule number one, be faithful to your wife. No sexual fornication. That's what holiness is referred to in every letter. And by the way, coming out of that Greek culture, they were saturated with sexual immorality. All right, so now we're, I've got to speed up here. We're just not going to cover it. You know, I talk way too much. But understand this, this outline, first 11 chapters, Gentile-centric. Genesis 12 through Acts, actually I go, I'll go Acts 1, is Jewish-centric. Acts 2, the birth of the church, through Revelation 4.1, all the epistles dealing with the church, including the book of Revelation, which is written to seven churches, by the way, whereas Malachi said to be continued, Revelation says don't add to or take away from. Now let me just ask you, when it comes to the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, who's being addressed, the church or the Jews? If you remember this pattern in your Bible study, it will simplify things a whole lot more. And by the way, we'll probably talk about the Olivet Discourse in detail next week. Now. Here's what I want to point out. Paul on a second missionary journey winds up being driven across Asia. Wants to go south, Holy Spirit forgives him. Wants to go north, Holy Spirit forgives him. Winds up in Troas, has a vision, a man from Macedonia saying, come help us. He comes across to Philippi, wound up in jail, but did see Lydia and her household saved. Next went to Thessalonica, and that's where we're at. Here's the thing that's remarkable. He taught the truth of Jesus. And the argument in the synagogues, which is where Paul went, and began his ministry every time, was, is Jesus the Messiah? The Jews said he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is the king who's going to rule and reign. And he can't be the Messiah because he suffered and died. Paul said, oh no, look at Psalm 22. Look at Isaiah 53. Look at Daniel 9. He is the Messiah. We know he's the Messiah because he suffered and died and rose again. You know what happened every time? Some believed. You know what else happened? Many didn't. 
But over a course of three weeks, because Paul was only here long enough to be there for three days of teaching, when the Jews got together in the synagogue and taught and lectured and discussed and debated. So for three Sabbath days, Paul reasoned with them out of the Scriptures and then was chased out of town. And do you know what? Paul was there three weeks, and in First and Second Thessalonians, we deal with the rapture of the church. We deal with eschatology. We think of eschatology as being something advanced, like level four college. It's actually level one. It's basic introduction. Here's why, very briefly. You know, Israel was birthed. They were in the middle of the Gentile nations. They were supposed to be a lighthouse to the Jews, drawing all the world, a lighthouse to the Gentiles, drawing all the world to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, if you disobey me, I'm going to chase you out of the land. As a matter of fact, if you read it close, they chased him out of the land. They came back. And then the Messiah came, and they rejected him. So God chased them out of land again. They're going to be out of the land for a long time, and at the second coming is when he establishes his kingdom. It's interesting. The prophet Isaiah says, by the way, this was before they had been chased out of the land the first time. Isaiah said that the Messiah is not going to rule and reign until the Jews have been gathered back in the second time. Twice out twice returned, by the way, not just in Babylon, but from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and all the islands of the sea. So they're going to be dispersed to the four corners uh, of the earth. Now, during the diaspora, the, Jew, the, where the Jews were dispersed. The Jews were everywhere. They were up in Babylon, the area of Babylon. In fact, a heavy Jewish center in Babylon. And they were around North Africa. They were throughout all of Europe. They had saturated the world. And everywhere they went, they had synagogues. Everywhere there, there was at least 10 Jewish men, they would assemble together in a synagogue. By the way, our churches are derived from synagogues. But except for needing 10 to establish a synagogue, we can where two or three are gathered together, can have an ecclesia, a called out assembly of local fellowship. Now, around the world, every country worshipped a pantheon of gods. And there was always a head deity, whether it was Zeus for Greece or Mars for, for Rome. They had their pantheon of gods. And around all of the idolatry, it revolved around sexual immorality. If you go with us to Israel, if the Lord hadn't come first, we go back. We'll go to uh, Beth, um, uh, Beth, um, oh, we're going to go, we'll go somewhere. And... There's a pagan temple right in the middle, Beth Shen. There's a pagan temple right in the middle. And around it, there's like little one-room apartments right around the temple. You know what that was for? It was for the temple prostitutes. With sexual immorality, with, with temple, with, with the idolatry was temple prostitution, both male and female. So that was the norm. All the nations of the world had a pantheon of gods and was built on immorality. But then you had these strange group of Hebrews that were monotheistic. Believed in one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this strange group of Hebrews also believed in the monogamous family and morality. So they were very distinct and very different. And because of their distinction, they were attractive to other cultures. Now, they always maintained their identity. Remember, God gave them strict dietary rules, gave them strict fabric rules. They had to wear talits, tassels, all sorts of things that marked them as being distinct and different. So they never assimilated into other cultures. They never assimilated in the United States of America. You know, I've got Irish background, Scotch background, probably some Indian, and probably a half a dozen other things as well. But I'm just an American. You know what? Jews are known as American Jews. They've always maintained their identity. In this period of time, they maintained their identity. And Gentiles were always drawn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember when Jesus went to the temple and he said, you've turned my house into a den of thieves when it's supposed to be a house of prayer to all nations, right? Okay, so the Jews are supposed to be a kingdom of priests drawing the entire world to the truth of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what their mission was. And they were somewhat successful. In all of these synagogues, there were Gentiles that became Jews in order to become part of the family of faith. Now, that's where the issue comes in. Again, synagogues were already everywhere. Paul left. 
He would go up here to Iconium. He would go to Sardis. He would go to Philippi, Thessalonica. Where would he go? Did he just go down to the marketplace? Nope. Where did he go? Synagogues. Every Sabbath. What did he debate? Who was the Messiah? Hey, the Messiah has come. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. We reject him. He's crucified. But he rose again, just as the Scriptures say. Fall on your knees and cry out and trust Jesus for your salvation. And you can be born again. Okay? That's where he was working. They understood that. And there were many that came. But the debate that we have today is not anything that the first church debated. We now argue about baptism. Should you be sprinkled? Should you be immersed? Is it baptism as a baby? Is it baptism upon profession of faith? Is baptism a sign? That wasn't even the debate then. The, ba the debate over the first church was, do you have to be circumcised? Boy, I've got to tell you, evangelism would be a whole lot difficult, more difficult if this was required. <laughs> Dr. Kennedy had to write a whole new chapter to his, to his book as we're teaching uh, Evangelism Explosion. Okay, you answer right here. If you call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Okay, you got it? Okay, let's pray. Okay, next thing, this is called a pocket knife. This is a bris. I think we'd lose a lot. All right, this was the debate. Of course, Peter was given the vision, the sheet with unclean animals in it. God said, kill and eat. And the, the point was, he went to Cornelius' household, preached the gospel to the Roman centurion Cornelius. The Holy Spirit visibly fell upon Cornelius. He was obviously born again, was not circumcised. Whoa, Gentiles don't have to become Jews, become Christians. Paul wrote the letter to the Galatian churches. Again, Galatians is dealing with Gentiles who were kept drawing to try to become Jews. Paul never taught that Jews were to stop being Jews, and he never taught Gentiles had to become Jews. Then you had the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, which dealt with the subject in finality. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the pastor of that congregation, said this, here's what we've decided. After Peter had testified, after Paul and Silas had testified, here's this. For as much as we have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. In other words, there were evangelists that were going out saying that the church in Antioch and James was saying that you had to keep the law and you had to become circumcised. He said, we never said that. It seemed good unto us in this assembly, being all together, to send chosen men unto you along with Barnabas and Paul, so it wasn't just Barnabas and Paul. They couldn't be trusted. They were biased. So we sent some other men along with them, Judas and Silas, went along with them back up to Antioch. And, of course, the message spread from there. Here's all that was required of the Gentiles. Here's all we ask you Gentiles. Don't eat meat offered to idols. Reject idolatry altogether. And don't offend your Jewish brethren. God says the blood belongs to him. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And also, the, don't, we're not going to eat live animals. There's cruelty there. We're gonna, there's a way to sacrifice an animal. And in every situation, keep your temple pure. Keep away from fornication. That was it. No circumcision, nothing else. Well, here is the question. Listen, because this is the point of the lesson. The next question that would be asked was, well, if we don't have to become Jews in order to become followers of the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then is God done with Israel? And the answer is emphatically no. By the way, that is dealt with in depth in the book of Romans. And somehow or other we get Calvinism when the purpose of the letter is dealing with dispensationalism. Chapter 9 deals with Israel past, their election, Chapter 10 deals with Israel present, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, uh, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever, both Jew and Gentile, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Then in chapter 11, we see Israel future. And Paul begins with this, has God cast off his people? For heaven's sakes, no. I had a grandmother, you say, for land's sakes. No. I also am an Israelite, seed of Abraham, tribe of Israel. God hath not cast away his people who he foreknew. So that is the question. That's what's being answered. And that's why, by the way, that was also dealt with and, and inferred. We miss it. 
because we're 21st century American Christians. We're not looking for it. This has nothing to do with their subject matter of, uh, of circumcision and that symbol in Acts chapter 15 unless you recognize the understood question, if they don't have to become circumcised to become Jews, is God done with Israel? Simon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles, take out of them a people for His name. And to this degree, the words of the promise of the prophet Amos, he said, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. This has nothing to do with circumcision. This has everything to do with God keeping His promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and having a literal Israel with the seed of David being Jesus ruling and reigning from the throne of David. Is everybody still with me to this point? So that's why I say eschatology is not advanced studies. The Jews were looking for the coming of the Messiah. Of course, we know Daniel recognized and was revealed that the, that the discipline had been multiplied times seven. We know that this was pronounced upon Jerusalem and upon the Jews. And we know that at the end of this, after 70 times seven, after this last seven-year period, then everything is going to be brought to a conclusion, and the Messiah is going to be anointed in the most holy place and the kingdom of heaven, which is that first vision in Daniel chapter 2, will be revealed and established on earth with the Messiah ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. We know that Daniel specified key points to be looking for. 483 years until the Messiah, the Prince, would show up. And he did, fulfilling to the minute, most minute detail the prophecies of Zechariah 9.9. But he was rejected, and he was crucified. As Scripture said, Daniel received this about 540 B.C. Said the Messiah would be cut off. That word is karat in the Hebrew, sacrificed. And he was. This was not a surprise to God. As a matter of fact, it had to happen. He had to be the Lamb of God and die for the sins of the world. That's why He came as the suffering servant the first time. He's coming again as King of kings. By the way, that was the confusion to the Jews. We see the Messiah as the suffering servant in Zechariah 9. We see the Messiah as King of kings, uh, the general of the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 14. How do you mesh the two? One conclusion was that there were two Messiahs. Messiah, the son of Joseph, being not Joseph, Mary's husband, but Joseph, a type of... Joseph that went into bondage in Egypt and was a type of Christ, and Messiah, the son of David, who came and ruled in power and glory. They couldn't figure it out. What's the answer? It's one Messiah coming twice. What was hidden was this period that we are in. Jesus said when He's talking about the mystery parables of the kingdom, this isn't that the world getting better and better, describing the world getting worse and worse. He talks about this period of time which had been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Paul, in his letter to the church of Ephesus, what was the focus of the church of Ephesus of this letter, was teaching about this mystery of the church, which in other ages was not made known unto the Son of Men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which up to now had been hid in God who created all things by Christ Jesus. This period of time where Jesus stopped when He was teaching in Nazareth, the synagogue that He grew up in as a boy, he opened up the scroll, read about the Messiah, and stopped in mid-sentence. He stopped about the proclamation of salvation. He stopped before the tribulation, the day of vengeance of our God, and the millennial reign of Christ. Stopped right there and rolled it up. Why? Because He came the first time to accomplish this. He's coming the second time to accomplish this. 
coincides with this period also in Daniel. Clarence Larkin, Mountain Peaks of Prophecy. Looking forward, you see prophecies that were fulfilled his first coming. See prophecies that will be fulfilled in the second coming. What you don't see from this perspective is the valley we are in right now, this church. Again, the church age, the, the time of this called out assembly. So here is the point of the lesson. Okay, so your first century, I'm a Jew. I'm going around all the synagogues teaching about the Messiah. Gentiles were already familiar with it. Jews are unusual people. Here they are, they worship one God. We got a bunch. They're monogamous. Man, we, we're sexually immoral. What is it about these people? They're so unique in so many ways, so intrigued. As we come to the synagogue and become more intrigued by this, here's Paul, and they're all looking for the Messiah. And Paul shows up and says, hey, the Messiah's come. Died, rose again. That's why we know it's him. Great, wonderful. Well, do we have to get circumcised? No. All you've got to do is trust the finished work of the Lamb of God. Put your faith in Jesus and then go get baptized publicly, demonstrating that you're a follower of Jesus. Circumcision is not required. Wow, that's wonderful. Well, wait a second. If we don't have to become Jews to become Christians, is God done with Israel? What's the answer? No. Romans 9, 10, 11, Thessalonians. Paul taught about the mystery body, Jew and Gentile. Whosoever is called by the name of the Lord shall be saved. Letter to the Ephesians. Well, God does work through the church, but He's going to still fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the nation of Israel. Paul, how does all that fit? Well, let me tell you. After Jesus ascended back into heaven, he called us apostles. He called the apostles said, I want you to go in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit falls. And then the Holy Spirit falls, I want you to be my witness. Not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but I'm going to send you out to Samaria. In fact, I'm going to send you to all the Gentile nations. And I want you to preach, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a mystery hidden from the Old Testament, both Jew and Gentile. It's by grace, through faith in Christ, plus nothing. Wow, how wonderful is all this. And this is going to carry on. Well, is God done with the Jews? No, He's not done with the Jews. Well, where do they fit in? After this, uh, after the fullness of the Gentiles become in. After this period of time called the church age is complete. When the last person is saved, then the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we, we Christians who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort each other with this exciting news. Great, wonderful. Then, and he's taught them about the tribulation. They're certainly aware of the 70th week of Daniel because Jesus taught about it and Paul taught about it. Then all of a sudden they get this letter that says uh, the tribulation has already begun. Paul corrects them. 2 Thessalonians says, no, remember these things that I told you. Okay? So is God done with Israel? Nope. Is eschatology important? Apparently so. Because Paul dealt with it within the first three weeks that was teaching in Thessalonica. And again, you understand the background. God, if you don't have to be circumcised, if you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian, then is God done with Israel? No. That's what Paul deals with, two distinct bodies. The ecclesia, this called out assembly, and the nation of Israel. By the way, is every Jew saved? Oh, and by the way, here's, here's what the Jews saw in their timeline. They saw Zechariah 9.9. They saw Zechariah 14, Joel 3. They didn't see this period in between. This is what's here. The ascension. The age of the church. And again, in the book of Revelation, when you consider that it is a book of prophecy. And folks, it amazes me. What is the one book out of the 66 that promises a special blessing if you study it? Book of Revelation. And do you know that most seminaries will say, do not teach from Revelation because it's apocalyptic, it's confusing. It's the one book that's promised to be a special blessing. 
It reveals, beginning in chapter 6 through chapter 19, it reveals the details of this last seven-year judgment to be poured out upon Israel and upon the world. Find out a lot of the specifics. By the way, one of the reasons I personally believe it is such a blessing to study it, because out of 404 verses, there are over 800 references, quotes, or allusions to the Old Testament. The reason so many cannot grasp Revelation is because the modern church has no depth of the first 39 books of the Bible. As a matter of fact, we've even seen local, very famous pastors that say we might as well just disconnect from the first 39 books of the Bible. Folks, the last 27 are built upon the truth of the first 39. The last 27 are referencing from and pointing back to the first 39. It's one book looking forward to the coming Messiah, looking back at the, at, the, at the having come Messiah being the complete work and revelation and Word of God. So, we see in, last thing, we'll close right here. John is told to write, told that it's a book of prophecy. We know through the church father Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, a disciple of a disciple of John. He was one generation removed from John. Irenaeus, in his work against heresies, wrote that John received the revelation while on the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Emperor Domitian, 96 A.D. Now, Hank Hanegraaff, who I think is a very good Bible teacher in about 70% of what he covers, and about 30%, I just don't, I don't, don't agree with him. He believes that the book of Revelation was fulfilled when the temple fell in 70 A.D. Well, Irenaeus, who lived around 150, said that it didn't happen, that John didn't receive a revelation until 96 A.D. I think I, I, that's hard to overcome. I mean, you can, you can disagree with it if you'd like to, but that's, there's not any testimony that is stronger or closer that would confirm what I happen to believe said, write, and it's outlined, past, present, and future. Chapter 1 is past. Chapters 2 and 3 is present. Chapters 4 and 5 is heaven, right after the rapture, fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 7, 13, and 14, where the Son of Man approached the Ancient of Days and received the title deed to planet Earth to establish His eternal kingdom on Earth. In between, Chapters 2 and 3, you have seven specific churches being addressed. I think it's interesting that of these seven churches, five of them are mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. So these aren't famous churches. This wasn't like writing to Antioch or writing to Rome. But for some reason, these seven churches were chosen. And here's why. I believe that these seven churches, when you read about them, laid out in this particular order, were not just seven literal churches of their day, with different compliments and different uh, judgments, but also is a perfect picture of this entirety of the church age. Ephesus, the apostolic church, the church that lost its first love. Smyrna, the persecuted church, crushed and emitted a beautiful fragrance. Pergamos, the church of the perverse marriage, where Constantine, rather than persecuting the church, married the church and church and state became one. Thyatira, the church of the dark ages. Sardis, the church of the Reformation, had a big name, but really didn't accomplish nearly as much as she thought she did. And by the way, the church of the Reformation got soteriology, got salvation right. But they continued to adopt many of the practices of the corrupt old Roman Catholic church, uh, including replacement theology. Then you have the church of the open door. During this era, we've had the uh, missionary movement. We've had the great awakening, we, first and second. We've had the printing press and the publishing of the Bible, where it's the number one book in the world. We've had the Billy Graham crusades, the Billy Sunday crusades. And then the last is that lukewarm church, the church that the Lord Jesus wants to throw up. And then... We see chapter 4, verse 1, John says, I heard a voice from heaven as if a trump saying, come up hither. 
And immediately after this, I was in the throne of God. And the description was identical to what you see, one in the temple, but also in uh, Daniel chapter 7, specifically verses 13 and 14. We'll be teaching some on Daniel chapter 7 today. Uh, by the way, I think that's where we're done. All right. Eschatology is basic, fundamental Christianity. So many Protestant denominations that have retained a Catholic replacement view of end times. That's why it's not taught. And nobody wants to talk about it because they don't want to get into arguments. I don't either. I don't like getting into arguments. That's why I just present Scripture and lay it out in context. You can either believe it or not believe it. Acts 17, 11, you've got that privilege. Seminarians are not to teach the book of Revelation. It's amazing that that's being promoted in our seminaries across the country. Few churches preach about end times. We consider it advanced training, but the reality is it was very fundamental teaching in the first century church. If God is not done with Israel, then how is God currently working through the church and still going to keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David? Got it? All right, now tell it back to me.